If you are watching on YouTube, we've got about five minutes before we're going to get started. I'm just making sure doing sound check, like not sound checks, I guess, because you couldn't hear me, but I'm just making sure everything's sharing to the right place. So um, be patient if you're on the YouTube channel. Um, I will be back in about five minutes.
All right, guys. Hey, happy Saturday. I'm glad everybody's here. If somebody can't hear me and you see me talking, please let me know. Um, this is being live streamed on YouTube and hopefully I don't have any problems with that. That is muted, so it shouldn't be an issue. Um, happy Saturday. I'm glad you're taking a moment to uh, focus on you and your health this morning and get some information. I think this is going to offer a lot of information. So if any, you, anytime you need to come back to it, it's going to be on YouTube. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to put it. The question and answer box is up. You can put anything in there that you need. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. There is a lot of information here. So I want to be sure that um, we have enough time to go through everything. Um, I am using new technology here and y'all know that I struggle with the tech sometimes. So bear with me if things aren't going perfect. This seems to be going off without a hitch, but fingers crossed. Um, we are gonna be going through food labels. Clearly that's what we're doing here, right? So if you have any ingredients in foods that you love and you're wondering, is this a problem child? please make sure you bring that. Make sure you put it in the question and answer. At the end, we should have enough time to go through some of those things. So make sure that you get those questions answered. So let's talk about food labels. So there is a lot of confusion I feel around food labels, partly because this the food labeling on our foods is an intersection between the FDA trying to keep us safe in our foods and the food manufacturers having proprietary information and financial interest in selling new food, okay? What happens when there is that cross-section, that intersection, is that we tend to then have, like, the food industry doing things that maybe is sketchy at best or dishonest at worst, and so we have to really learn how to navigate these food labels for ourselves, for our best interest, because the food industry is not doing it. And the FDA is caught, I don't know, I don't think the FDA does a great job of it, but they definitely are caught between a rock and a hard spot. So what is low fat? What is heart healthy? What is non-GMO? What is, you know, real fruit? What is xanthan gum? That's one of my favorites. What are those things? What's guar gum and xanthan gum? What's in natural flavoring? What's in artificial flavoring? Is stevia Okay. All of these things, seeing them on our food label, we need to know what is happening in our body when that is on the ingredient label so that we can figure out what do we need to do differently? How is this impacting our blood sugars? How is this impacting our health? So today we're going to understand, I want to understand how these food labels impact our blood sugars, impact our health. That is one of the things I want everybody to walk away with. The other thing is these standard nutrition labels. What information can I glean from those labels? What does it mean? How does it impact my health? How does the ingredient list impact my health? And then we're going to go through some of these ingredient lists because they are really, really um, sketchy. They're just sketchy. It is what it is. You're going to have to, it's like learning another language entirely. So learning to decode those is going to be really important for you um, to reverse your diabetes and protect your health. Um, I do want to review the basics of type 2 diabetes. I like to do this on all of the webinars because what I teach and what I teach the women in my group and what I teach in my podcast and what I teach in these webinars is not about fixing your blood sugars. That does need to happen and it will happen. But the thing you have to fix to fix your type 2 diabetes is you have to fix your insulin resistance. And some things that cause insulin resistance are not going to show up as higher blood sugars. So you have to learn to fix your insulin resistance. For the most part, insulin resistance is caused, the root cause of insulin resistance, which is the cause of your type two diabetes. For the most part, it is caused by too much insulin in your system, okay? So what causes too much insulin in your system is what we have to fix. Processed foods is 85, 90% of the problem. Not only because processed foods concentrate carbohydrates, which they do, and I'm going to explain what that means here in a minute, but also because processed foods put chemicals in their foods that can cause cravings, that can cause inflammation, that can cause insulin to rise in a way that has nothing to do with carbohydrates. 
processed foods will cause your type two diabetes period. End of sentence. Cutting these out of your diet is how you're going to fix your health. Okay. Women always come to me and they're, I don't, I just got an e a direct message on Instagram. I don't know that I can fix this. Is this even possible? Give yourself a fighting chance by learning to cut these processed foods out of your diet in order for you to decide, is this possible? Does this work? Give yourself that fighting chance before you say, no, I just need to be on meds. Okay. That's what we're going to talk about today. How do we determine what's processed and why is it a problem? So this macronutrient component, when I said that we can't, the processed food concentrates carbohydrates, what am I talking about? Different macronutrients. There are three natural macronutrients that the human being comes into contact with. A fourth unnatural one would be things like alcohol. And we're not going to talk about that, but macronutrients will create an insulin response. All of our food can be broken down into one of these three macronutrients. There are micronutrients, those are vitamins and minerals. We're not talking about that. And you don't get a uh, insulin response from too much calcium in our diet, right? Like that isn't what causes insulin. These three macronutrients will cause insulin to be produced in our bodies. They are fat and there's a minimum minimal insulin response with that. There are proteins and there is a moderate insulin response with that. And then there are carbohydrates and there is an exaggerated large insulin response with carbohydrates. Okay. So the, um, processing of our foods is what creates this concentration of the carbohydrate in our foods. And then we get this huge exaggerated response of insulin. And remember, too much insulin causes insulin resistance, which causes your type two diabetes. You have got to fix that insulin component. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The food label is going to tell you how many of these macronutrients you're getting in your diet. That's what it is so helpful with in fixing our type two diabetes. So these food labels, um, they don't, only tell you like, oh, I need to restrict this because it has all these carbohydrates in it. That isn't the only thing that it's telling you. It also tells us how much protein am I getting in my diet? Do I need more? Like my body needs protein to build muscles, to maintain muscles. Muscles help you be more insulin sensitive. It is the opposite of insulin resistance and diabetes. If you're not providing your body with enough protein because we're overeating carbohydrates, if we're not doing that, we're not going to create the health that our body needs. So recognizing that um, we there's more than just this restrictive component of the food labeling, okay? I am gonna put this Nutritionix in the chat. Um, that's a website. I love this website. You don't have to love it. People can hate it. That's fine. You can go to it though. They put, they um, compile information in the same way that these, um, the standard nutrition label is given to us. So you can find it for anything. You can find it for anything. Celery, celery doesn't have a nutrition label on it when you buy it from the grocery store. Nutritionix has one though. You can look it up there. You can go to a restaurant and you can get ch chicken teriyaki or just something that's like, oh, I don't know what that is. Like there's not gonna be a label on that food, but you can go to Nutritionix and you can put chicken teriyaki in there. Now, is it gonna be exact and perfect for the same that you got at a restaurant? No, it's probably not, but it's going to give you a good idea. And as you're planning your foods, using this website to figure out how much food or how many carbohydrates is in the food that I'm planning on eating, this is going to give you a good place to start. So um, use that website. I highly recommend that website. I am not paid or sponsored by that website. I just think that it's a really helpful website. In fact, I don't even have the paid version of that website, but I use it a lot. So determining your carbohydrate content in your food and the food that you eat is at the heart. This is the crux of normalizing your insulin function, your insulin resistance and fixing your type two diabetes. So I want to talk about that and walk through what these nutrition labels actually mean. So the first thing that I need you to look at on a nutrition label is a serving size. This is imperative. Lots of people will be like, oh, it says there are, you know, this says there's 12 grams and this, that's what we think, right? Well, 
it's 12 grams in one cup. That's the serving size. The arrow here is denoting the serving size on these labels. It's 12 grams of carbohydrates in one cup on the label on the left. It is 17 grams in 21 grams of the food or nine crackers on the label on the right. That means if you eat more than one cup of the stuff on the left or more than nine crackers for the label on the right, you are not going to only be getting those 17 grams of carbohydrates or in this uh, on the left, the 12 grams of carbohydrates. If you eat one and a half cups of whatever that is, you're getting 1.5 times 12. So you're going to get 18 grams of carbohydrates. This is the first thing that you have to look at. And it's very important because a lot of times you're like, oh, I'm sure I'm having one serving. And then if you actually go and measure it, you realize you're having 1.75 servings or two servings. And suddenly your carbohydrate count for the day really gets skewed and become, it looks different. So making sure that you're looking at the serving size and that you understand. And if there are any questions, we're going to take a, uh, I want to make sure that we're going to work through these nutrition labels first, and then we're going to look at new, or I'm sorry, ingredient lists. I'm going to give the opportunity to ask some questions at the end of this. So if you have a question about how to calculate this information, please ask. This is imperative. This is like, you have to learn the skill of kind of doing this calculation process. And I think that sometimes it can be complicated. So making sure you have all of those questions asked, make sure you put them in the Q&A box. I will see them and I will answer them. And if you need to come on live so that we can answer, we can do that, okay? Um, but I wanna make sure you understand how to utilize these nutrition labels. Again, this arrow that you see on these uh, labels on this slide, you can see it's pointing to the carbohydrate count. Again, the carbohydrate count here that we are talking about is the count, the number of carbohydrates present in a single serving of this food. So you can see on the label on the left, it's 12. On the label on the right, it's like carbohydrate. You can kind of see it to the side of the finger, but it's kind of covered up by this finger. There's 17 grams of carbs in nine crackers. If you eat... 12 crackers, you are going to have to multiply 17 by 1.3 because 12 is a third more than the serving size. Okay. Again, this is math. I think I take it for granted. I can remember trying to learn this in chemistry when I was in college and it was not easy. It took me a while to get practiced at utilizing this way of, um, this way of multiplying what that information is and how do we convert that? It took me a while. Maybe I was just slow. That's fine. If you need help with this, don't hesitate to ask. So that's the carbohydrate count. You can see the fat count on the, I think this is important to point out on the nutrition label on the left and one gram or in one cup of that food, whatever it is, there are zero grams of fat in that. I want you to hear me per the FDA guidelines and laws a food manufacturer does not have to report when it's less than 0.5 on certain foods. There's some nuances to that, but on certain foods, they do not have to report when there's less than 0.5 grams of a macronutrient in a serving. What that means, if there is 0.25 grams of something in a single serving, they don't have to report it. They can report it as zero. That means that if you're eating three servings, you're actually getting 0.75. And this is important maybe for carbohydrates more than it is for like whatever, like, I don't know, milk or, you know, skim milk or whatever. I would not recommend skim milk, but like that's probably not as important, the fat count, but the carbohydrate count might be for you. So if you're eating three servings, for example, if something has zero carbohydrates in a serving and you're like, it's a free for all, I can eat all I want. And you're eating three or four or five servings of it. And it has 0.4 grams of carbs in it. Three or four or five servings start to add up. So be aware that they don't have to report if it's under 0.5 servings or 0.5 grams per serving. If it's under half of a gram per serving, they don't have to report it. So zero may not mean zero. Just be aware of that. Um, you can see on the crackers, the um, whatever crackers they are on the right, there's 1.5 grams of carbs in a single serving, which is nine crackers. And then the protein. And again, the protein's covered up on the label on the right. I apologize, but it's one gram. You can see um, just because that's how these standard labels are pointed out. There's one gram 
of protein per nine crackers. And on the other one, you can see there's nine grams. I really do wonder if this isn't like skim milk, nine grams of protein per one cup of whatever that um, uh, nutrition label is on the left. So again, I want to take a minute. If you have any questions about this, feel free to put them in the chat. Feel free to put it in the um, question and answer. I'm happy to answer anything. I just want to make sure that everybody understands how to calculate that. If you're like, yep, I totally get it straightforward. That's great. Put it in there. Say, let's go. And we'll move on to the ingredient list. The ingredient list it is. It's like um. It's like a, It's like you get a decoder ring when you look at it, and sometimes the ingredient list I think is more intriguing, and there's going to lead to a lot of questions from that probably. So I want to make sure that any questions about these food lists uh, or these nutrition labels are um, answered before we jump into the ingredient list. All right, and you can. Oh, I don't know that we have the raise your hand. Um, enabled on this. So maybe you can't raise your hand, but if anything comes up as we go through this, make sure that you um, pop those questions in. So we are going to move on and we are going to talk about ingredient labels. So ingredient labels, again, it is like decoding. If you've ever read an ingredient label, you know this. An ingredient label has all sorts of chemical names on it in many of our food our food, many of their ingredient labels have all sorts of chemical names on it. And we're going to talk about how do you decode it and how do you utilize that information. The ingredients in our food impact our health in many ways. We're going to talk mainly about the metabolic impact that on our health. So how these ingredients impact our metabolic health. We're going to talk about how these ingredients create addictive tendencies and then we're going to talk about how they impact our gut microbiome. These are not the only ways that these ingredients impact our health. If you have or know of something and have questions about it, make sure you pop it in the q and I'm happy to answer anything that doesn't seem to fit into one of these three categories. In my experience, these are kind of the three primary places that these food ingredients impact our health. So metabolic effect is a big one. Okay. So these foods impact our cells' ability to use insulin, okay? It impacts our insulin and the insulin function inside the cell. So you can see this schematic drawing here is a cell, okay? This red part is the insulin. The bottom is the insulin receptor. And the red ball that fits into that receptor is insulin. That's what's meant to be represented here. Clearly, this is not an accurate... Oh, we just slid forward. This is not a, um, it's not a micro, uh, you know, electron cell uh, microscopy picture here. That's not what's happening here. This is a schematic, right? When this binds, it opens up this blue channel. This blue channel is the channel that allows glucose to flow inside the cell. And you can see these little blue um, spots are glucose molecules flowing inside the cell. What happens then is the cell is allowed or is able then to utilize the glucose's fuel. That's what's happening here. That's what should happen. This is normal functioning cells, insulin sensitive cells, not insulin resistant cells. Okay. These foods, these processed foods, these chemicals, these things that are added to our foods, they impact either the cell opening or they impact our ability to utilize the cell or the glucose inside the cells, okay? So the binding here either doesn't happen because it's overbound, right? Like when we have so much insulin in our system, there's suddenly not enough of these receptors to bind all the insulin. They get overbound and then we can't bring this glucose inside. That's part of it. Or there are things that we eat that inside the cell block up the machinery inside the cell that uses, that burns the cell or the glucose as fuel. Okay. This happens both from increasing that carbohydrate concentration. Remember that's what processed foods primarily do. When we take a natural food and we process it, we are concentrating the carbohydrate component of that food. That's what's happening. Then there's also the addition of substances that block the cells. So things that we put into foods that block the internal functioning of the cell, 
so that the cell can no longer burn off that glucose. We're going to discuss all of these things. So there's also this addictive tendency that occurs. I don't know what's happening downstairs with my dogs. I don't know if you can hear it, but clearly there's something exciting going on down there. My kids are down there, so they'll take care of it. But there is the addictive tendency of these foods. So these foods interact with our brain in our way that we want more of the food. That's just what's happening. Okay. Recognize that carbohydrate, sugar, glucose, and crackers get broken down to glucose. Rice gets broken down to glucose. It's not just Pop-Tarts that get broken down into glucose. It's not just cake and donuts. All of these carbohydrates get broken down into glucose. Glucose binds the same receptor in our brain that heroin binds. It's just how it works. Does it bind as intensely? No, nobody's robbing from grandma to get M&Ms or donuts, okay? But it does bind, it does utilize the same receptors in our brain that drugs like heroin, and that's gonna be all of your narcotics. And we know there's this huge narcotic problem in our country right now. The sugar binds the same receptors in our brain that those drugs bind. There is definitely an addictive tendency there. In addition to the sugar, right? And again, when we process foods, we concentrate the carbohydrate. The carbohydrates all get broken down into sugar. Those sugars bind these receptors, but that's not enough. In addition to that, we add chemicals that create cravings and desire for these foods. And we're going to talk about that. And then lastly, there is the impact of these foods, these chemicals, these things that go into our food, the impact of those molecules of substances on our gut microbiome. So the chemicals and the substances that we put into processed foods impact the gut microbiome. So the gut microbiome, there's so much, I'm sure I'm not the first one to tell you about the gut microbiome. I'm sure you're hearing about this other places because there's just a ton of new information coming out each year on the importance of protecting our microbiome on our body. As human beings, bacteria live on us. They live on all the human beings. They always have. They're not a problem. They do not cause disease. Some bacteria will cause disease, but lots of bacteria live on our bodies and they never cause any disease in our bodies. They just live there and we have this symbiotic relationship. They help us out. We help them out. Life is great and grand, okay? There is bacteria that live in our gut and this is the normal gut microbiome. They just live there. They make molecules that actually get absorbed into our gut and go to different parts of our bodies. And they tell our body things like what's happening in the gut. It tells our brain things. It tells our pancreas things. It tells our liver things. These chemicals that these bacteria make, they're like fatty acids. They're all sorts of things that our bacteria make. They tell our body other things. And these bacteria live in our mouth. They live in our gut. They live on our skin. They live all sorts of places. This is normal. Okay. And they send messages to our body about what's happening within our body. Okay. When we put additives into these foods, they impact these bacteria and their ability to send messages, pesticides, preservatives, colorings, emulsifiers, and all sorts of other things. They damage the gut microbiome and they're not sending you appropriate messaging. In addition, there is an, there is a protective role that these gut microbiomes have that these gut bacteria have on protecting our gut lining from things that are in our food. Things like other pathogenic bacteria, funguses, viruses, fungi, not funguses, just so you know, viruses, all of these different things that are coming in on our food. We're not sterilizing our food before we eat them. There are all sorts of things that come in on those food items that we have to protect our entire our inside body from the outside, right? That gut is considered outside and these bacteria protect you from those things, okay? There's such a huge role of what the gut microbiome does. And when we eat pesticides, pesticides are meant to kill bacteria and bugs. It's literally why we put them on our foods, right? We're wanting to sterilize those foods. We're really wanting to sterilize the bugs that might damage our ability to grow the crops so that we don't make as much money from the crop that we're growing. That's really what pesticides are meant to do. And when we eat those pesticides, they kill these bacteria that live in our gut that are protecting us and doing all of these major huge functions. And I'm not sitting here trying to tell you 
only eat organic, but there's definitely benefit to eating organic. I definitely choose organic for me and my family when I can. Okay. It's true for the preservatives. It's true for the uh, emulsifiers, the um, artificial sweeteners, damage our gut microbiome, all of these things are a reality. Okay. So protecting our gut microbiome is another huge player. When we have processed foods, like definitely unprocessed foods, apples, broccoli, all of these things have pesticides on them, right? So we need to protect ourselves from that. But there is a concentration of that natural food in our processed foods, which means there's also a concentrated exposure to things like pesticides in those uh, processed foods. So let's talk about some basic um, approaches, like just some basic overarching themes to protect you when you're looking at ingredient lists. We're gonna talk about foods are listed by weight, like your ingredients are listed by weight on your ingredient list. So we're gonna talk about that. Another basic overarching approach. Ingredients on the ingredient list should be things, items that you know, you can visualize, you know what they are. And then we are going to talk about red flag ingredients. These are the basic strategies that you need to use when you're looking at an ingredient list. One of the main things that you can do to make sure your ingredient list is quote unquote clean, one of the main things you can do look for a short ingredient list. A shorter ingredient list is hands down better. I always talk about coffee versus energy drinks, right? When I look at the ingredient list on my coffee, it's coffee and water. Boom, dot. And I know what water is and I know what coffee is. If I look at an energy drink, it is packed full of chemicals. There are dioxy blah, 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 blahs. It's just a chemical list. That is a longer list and it's stuff you don't know. If you apply this, foods are listed by weight uh, or ingredients are listed by weight. Ingredients should be items that you know and watching for red flags uh, ingredients. Yes, that's all in there. But really, if you just look for the shorter ingredient list, the ingredient list on your um, energy drink is very long and there's a lot of things you don't know on it versus coffee, water and coffee. So, and I'm not trying to say one's right or wrong. I'm just telling you, these are the ways that you can find out how you know, these uh, processed foods, like these are some strategies to apply to all of our foods to make sure like, is this process, is this a problem? Could this be a problem? These are some basic strategies to say kind of yes or no, to filter those into yes or no categories. So let's talk about this ingredients by weight. The food listed first on an ingredient list is the most abundant by weight in that food. So when it's listed, if you weigh all of the different ingredients, the first thing listed is the thing that weighs the most in that food. All right. So if you look at this ingredient list, it seems that flour, you can see unbleached, let me, unbleached flour. And then it lists in the parentheses, all the different things that go into flour. Okay. You can see that that's the primary ingredient, the thing that's listed first, okay? You can also see that we have sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and then fructose syrup are also listed. And they're listed not as the primary one, okay? Why this is important is because food manufacturers do not want to list sugar as the primary food source. Because when they do that, they have to um, market this food differently because it then is very clearly a junk food. They want to hide the fact that the primary food in these items are sugar, is sugar. They want to hide that, okay? So they start to break down sugar and they put it in their food in different forms so that those forms are not flagged as being just straight sugar in that food. If they just put all of the sugar, all of the things that can be classified as sugar into one ingredient, sugar would be the primary food in this food, which by the way, this, uh, this list, and, and I'm going to go through a number of different ingredient lists, this particular package, this particular label is um, Oreos. So uh, just so you realize, I mean, it's no wonder this is clearly like nobody's trying to think that Oreos are healthy, right? So let's talk about sugar. Sugars are going to be all the oses. Okay. So it's dextrose, maltose, lactose, fructose, all the oses. And sometimes they put them as ends, maltin, dextrin, sucrin. I mean, like they have all these different endings. You have to be very, very 
aware and critical of these lists, okay? Sugar is listed by various different names in your food, okay? Um, some of them are more egregious. Many of them will be listed multiple times. So they don't have to put it as the main ingredient, like we've talked about. Um, you have to be really, really critical of these lists because they will have fructose and, or they will have sugar listed multiple different ways. All of these things are sugars. Many of these things will cause your blood sugars to go up. They are frequently added because they know that they will bind those receptors in your brain and you will want this food more than any other food. That is why, and I'm not trying to promote any kind of um, conspiracy theory by foods. That's just the bottom line. They want to sell their food. It is their business model. If they can make you want their specific food more than any other food, they serve the bottom line in their business model. That's all it is. Okay. So they try to put as much of this stuff that will make you want more of it into their food as frequently as possible in an effort to sell you food, regardless of how sick it will make you. All of these foods, all of these things, all of these sugar names are going to cause you to make more insulin and it's going to worsen your insulin resistance on your, in your cells. Okay. So be aware that foods are listed. And of course, again, like in this food, this Oreo, like food list, right? You can see like unbleached flour, again, flour gets like broken down in your body into glucose. So flour is just glucose. That's all it is. So flour, i.e. glucose, sugar, i.e. glucose, high fructose corn syrup, i.e. glucose, and corn syrup, or and fructose syrup, i.e. glucose. All of those things get broken down into glucose in your body and absorbed and they cause your blood sugar to climb high. Remember, I said processed foods concentrate sugars, concentrate carbohydrates, and, and that causes this concentrated, exaggerated release of insulin into your body. I also want to point out, um, it's also syrups. Anything that has the word syrup on it, you should be questioning. Rice syrup, sugar. Molasses syrup, sugar. Fructose syrup, sugar. We're going to talk a little bit about maltodextrin because this is actually a red flag thing. And, and I'm going to explain why um, here in just a moment. So items you should know. This is another kind of overarching theme that you should kind of critique your ingredient list with. You should in critique your ingredient list based on, do I know this item? The items on your ingredient list, you should probably be able to picture them. You know, like maybe your grandmother had this in her cupboard, right? Like in my cupboard, there's baking powder and there's uh, baking soda, right? Like I can, in I can visualize, I don't necessarily know, but I can visualize what that is. Okay. I can visualize what um, strawberries are, right? I can visualize even flour, even straight sugar. I can visualize. I know how sugar comes. I can buy it at the store. But like high fructose corn syrup, I'm like, I've never actually seen that. I assume it's liquid. The same thing with rice syrup. I've never actually had rice syrup in my cupboard. And I don't think grandma did either, but I can visualize like that's probably a liquid, but that's all. I don't know anything else about it. So have you seen it at the grocery store? That's another great thing. Do you know where you would go to find that at the grocery store? Can you visualize this item? Is it a powder? Is it a liquid? Is it a solid? What is it? Those are things you should be asking yourself. If you're looking, diacylglycerides, what are diacylglycerides? When was the last time you came across a good, a good bottle of diacylglycerides? Nobody knows what that is. We don't know what those are. Those are not real human foods. Those are chemicals. Those are manufactured by food manufacturers and they are put in your food and they make you sick. Boom, period, end of sentence, okay? Start critiquing these food ingredient lists based on, do I know this food? What is this food? So I wanna talk about red flags. I, I love it. Somebody once told me, those are red flags. It's not a parade. It's not exciting. Don't look for these. These are things you need to avoid. These are red flag ingredients that you need to watch for. And again, they're red flag ingredients because they're put in your foods to make you want them more at the expense of your insulin resistance, like of creating insulin resistance. 
these red flag ingredients, I call them red flag ingredients because they put, are put in your foods to make you want them more and they cause your insulin to go up, creating worsening insulin resistance. Okay. So let's talk about maltodextrin. This is the big one and you see it in everything. Let me tell you, you see it in everything, including pre-cooked chicken. Okay. Not just the things that are sweet. You see maltodextrin in everything. Maltodextrin um, in the chicken taste-wise and like the, your experience, your like how much you like it, it makes the chicken more moist. It doesn't let it get so dry. So I bought, I was so clever. I was so good. I was doing so good. It was a package of like multi, like there were six, three on each side, pre-cooked chickens, right? Like they're just servings, chicken breast cut up, pre-cooked. I was like, awesome. I can throw this in the microwave. I can throw this in my lunchbox and I, I can eat this and it's going to be just protein. It's going to be fabulous. And I look at the ingredient list and there's like three grams of carbs in each of these. I was like, since when does chicken have carbs in it? I look at the ingredient list, maltodextrin was in it. Okay. So maltodextrin is tasteless. You will not taste the maltodextrin. It won't taste, your chicken isn't going to taste sweet. What it does do it goes to your, there are receptors in your gut lining right after you get through the stomach. There are receptors in that first part of your small intestine. They are neurons. Maltodextrin binds them, sending a message. Neurons travel from this part to your brain to say this food's amazing. Let's eat more. It makes you eat more. It makes you crave it more. It makes you want it more. That's what maltodextrin does. It causes your blood sugars to go up and it makes you want more of that food, even in food that doesn't taste sweet. Okay. Stay away from maltodextrin. There's nothing good coming from that food. MSGs, same thing. In addition, it causes headaches for a lot of people, right? It makes people feel poorly, but it also causes you to want more of the food. Okay, so stay away from anything. And that's mono, monosodium glutamate. That's what MSG stands for. Stay away from MSGs. Corn oils, vegetable oils, canola, canola oils. Guys, think about this. Corn oil, by, corns, corn by nature is not an oily substance. There is no natural corn oil. Unlike olive oil, right? You can totally like imagine like we press olives. Like you can press, you can make some olive oil on your own by going and getting some olives. Corn oil is not a naturally oil, oily substance. Vegetable oil is just corn oil with really clever, clever marketing. Because you read vegetable and you're like, it must be healthy. Everybody reads vegetable and thinks it must be healthy. Okay. Vegetable oil is just corn oil. Corn is a vegetable. We're like, ooh, it must be healthy. It is not. Canola oil, similarly, not healthy. If you're looking for an oil to cook with, you need to use... Um, canola or I'm sorry, not canola. Olive oil is going to be the most, it's got, just got the most evidence that it's good for you. Okay. So if you're sauteing food, if you're um, using it to, you know, keep maybe your meat from sticking to the pan, all of those things, olive oil is going to be your friend. Stay away from corn oil, stay away from vegetable oil, stay away from canola oil, stay away from Pam like sprays. Okay. If you're baking, recognize likely if you're baking anything that there is probably like flour involved. So, so it's, not going to be something that you're baking for health, but I will make banana muffins and I love them and they're delicious. And when it calls for oil, because every damn baking calls for vegetable oil, put vegetable, two tablespoons of vegetable oil. I just do two tablespoons of butter and I melt it. And that's what I bake with. Stay away from these vegetable oils. Um, high fructose corn syrup. We've kind of covered this. High fructose corn syrup is sugar and it's Sugar that's metabolized by our liver in a way that actually is worse for us. It makes our liver sick. <laughs> it makes us diabetic. Any fructose syrup, any fructose corn syrup, any high fructose corn syrup, stay away from those things. Gluten. Gluten's another red flag thing. One, it definitely is a carbohydrate and will make your blood sugars go higher. Two, it is very inflammatory. And this is just a different way that disease gets created or insulin gets created in our bodies. And this is kind of where we talk about um, pesticides, preservatives, emulsifiers, all of those things, including gluten, causes inflammation in our body. That inflammation causes our body to produce more insulin. That's a normal response of ins inflammation. Okay. So eating these foods that are highly inflammatory probably needs to be stopped if you're going to really work at improving your insulin resistance. Okay. 
things like acylglycerols. These are diacylglycerols. These are um, monoacylglycerols or glycerides. All of those things go, like there's evidence that they go inside the cell and they gum up. They block the intracellular component. Remember when I said, you know, there's this blocking of the insulin being bound and then we can't bring the glucose in. There's also the effect of these, some of these additives in our food block the internal workings of our cells. So even if the glucose can get in, the cell can no longer burn it off as fuel. Okay. All of this is bad news. Okay. We don't want this happening. So Acyl glycerol, or glycerides, glycerols, you're not going to find them in the cupboard. You don't know what they are. They are the precursors to producing triglycerides, which are inflammatory and definitely indicative of insulin resistance. If I look at your um, fasting lipid panel that you would get drawn at your doctor's office, you're going to have HDLs, you're going to have LDLs, you're going to have total cholesterol, and you're going to have triglycerides. Triglycerides are inflammatory, and they're thought to actually be one of the primary drivers of cardiac disease via inflammation, okay? Diacylglycerols, mono monoacylglycerols, or glycerides add to this triglyceride component, okay? In addition to all of this, these foods are added to create what's called a bliss point. If you don't know what a bliss point is, Google it. A bliss point is something that food manufacturers are trying to reach. It is the point of the perfect addition of fats and salts and sugars or carbohydrates to make you go, I love it. I love the way it tastes in my mouth. I love the way that it melts in my mouth. I love the way it tastes in my brain. I want more of it. All of these manufacture, all of these ingredients that food manufacturers put into your food is to get you to a bliss point so that you want more of it. That's all they're trying to do is create you wanting more of it. And that is why processed foods are such a problem. Okay. It's not that you can never, ever have processed foods again. I definitely have processed foods in my life. They're not a primary part of my life. They are definitely on that 20% of my life is where I see processed foods. And there has to be a part of your cell healing where you bring all of that processed food out of your life to allow your cells to heal. Um, artificial sweeteners, again, red flag. Why? Because they're creating craving, desire in your body for in your brain for these foods. Two, they can cause insulin to surge from the pancreas even when there's not carbohydrate associated with it. There is mixed evidence out there about how this happens or if this happens or how intensely this happens. But if you think about it, the only time that the human tongue in nature comes into contact with something sweet is when it is attached to a carbohydrate, right? So nuts may have some sweetness, but there's not a lot of carbohydrate associated with it. Meat, there's not a lot of carbohydrate associated with it. There's none. And there's no sweetness associated with it. Carrots, they have a little bit of sweetness to it. And there it's because there's a carbohydrate associated with it, right? Strawberries, carbohydrate associated with it. Honey, super sweet. Nature, yep. Lots of carbohydrate associated with that. The only time the tongue in nature comes into contact with sweetness it is attached to a carbohydrate, which means there has developed this pathway from the brain to the pancreas that the tongue tastes sweet. The brain says, Ooh, sweets here. We're going to get some carbohydrates. It sends a message to the pancreas to say, spit out insulin, start making insulin because we are going to get some carbohydrate. I just tasted it on the tongue. Okay. Remember when we are fixing your insulin resistance, we need to lower your insulin response. We need to lower your body's production of insulin. So if you're having aspartame or sucralose on your tongue and it's sweet, even when there's no carbohydrate associated with it, your brain may be sending a message to your pancreas that says, Hey, we're getting some sugars. We're getting some carbohydrates. Let's start putting out some insulin. So you're driving your insulin up even when there's no carbohydrate associated with it. Okay. So that's one part of why you want to stay away from artificial sweeteners. The craving that it creates in your brain, I think is another huge part. And then lastly, it is well documented that artificial sweeteners damage your gut microbiome. Okay. And there's a huge metabolic effect that the gut microbiome has on the human body. And in a way that is protective against type two diabetes, protective against 
high blood sugars, improving of glycemic effect of these foods. Okay. So you have to protect that. These chemicals, these artificial sweeteners damage the gut microbiome. So that's definitely something you're going to want to stay away from. Lastly, there was a question in the Facebook group about flavors, natural flavors and artificial flavors, and what do they mean? So I want to talk about that. So natural flavors, if you ask the food manufacturers, what is a natural flavor? A natural flavor is something that is derived from something that we found in nature. It's a flavor that's derived from something in nature. So what this means is they are taking natural foods and natural flavors, and they're extracting them from foods, natural foods, and they're concentrating them. And they're doing it to engineer engineer the taste that you like in the food. And it creates you wanting more of it, right? Because that's kind of the underlying currency of all processed foods is that the manufacturers want you to eat more of it. But you're not getting any of the health benefits that are associated with the natural food. You're not getting any of the fiber. You're not getting any of the polyphenols. You're not getting any of the phytochemicals. You're not getting any of the micronutrients, the uh, minerals, the vitamins that come with that natural food. So you're getting blueberry flavor, but none of the benefit of the blueberry, okay? There are also other things um, like oleoresins that are extracted from the natural food. They might have an essential or a fatty oil, but they use a lot of solvents to, so these are things like alcohols and um, esters and all sorts of chemistry to extract that natural flavor, right? So like the oleoresin is uh, one of the things, like if you just look up what is a natural flavor, oleoresin is one of the things that they will talk about. And it's the oleoresin of conifers. So these are going to be trees, pine, like nutty things is known as crude turpentine or gum turpentine and consists of the oil turpentine and rosin. Okay. So like that's some of the things. Oleoresins are definitely present in our natural food flavorings. Now, clearly it's not like just drinking a cup of turpentine because that would kill a human being, but these are the kind of things that they're doing to our foods to extract these natural flavors. And then they call them natural and you and I think that it's okay. Artificial flavors, the difference between natural and artificial flavors is that artificial flavors are straight chemicals. They aren't using any natural food to create that artificial flavor. They're just creating a flavor in the lab and that's what they're putting in your foods. So being aware of these natural and artificial flavors. Again, these are like the last you can see, like by weight, they're the lowest amount that you're gonna have in your food. But do be aware, if they're in there, they're covering up something. There's something that the food manufacturer is putting in that food, and it's made to make you want more. That's all that they're doing, okay? So um, natural flavors are derived, derived from natural foods. Artificial, artificial flavors are derived from, and I don't know, I meant to highlight over here where the artificial flavor is listed in the Oreo Um ingredient list, but they're derived from artificial compound, compounds or chemicals. So I want to take a few moments. Again, if anybody has something that they're wanting to go over specifically, a specific ingredient that you know is in your food or a specific food label that you're like, but no, I really think this protein powder is amazing. Like, please let me think that this is good for me. I want to believe it's good for me. Let me know. Put it in the... um. You can put it in the question and answer. You can um, put the ingredient in there. You can put it in the uh, chat section. If we need to look at something together, I can bring you on and we can do that. So we are going to talk some, we're going to go through some food labels. So uh, this is an organic protein blend. So it has, and again, you see the TM, that's a proprietary um, ingredient that they're protecting, but it has organic peas, organic, or, organic pea protein, organic brown rice protein, organic chia seeds. Great. Organic pet acai or whatever it is, uh, berry, organic, high oleic sunflower, high oleic sunflower oil. So there is question about whether oleic oils are good for us or inflammatory. Um, you have organic rice dextrin. So that's organic rice sugar. That's organic rice carbohydrate is what that is. Organic sunflower lecithin, these are emulsifiers. Lecithins are emulsifiers and they will damage your gut microbiome. You can see all of this. Great news. It's all organic. Literally, they even put organic erythritol on here. This is, and then of course you have xanthan gum at the bottom and that's just a um, texturizing 
something that adds a texture that we as human beings like. Interestingly about xanthan gum, this is a little random, but humor me. Xanthan gum and guar gums, I believe it was xanthan gum. Back in the 1980s when they added xanthan gum, like they started when the food chemistry people started to realize we could add this and create a texture to our foods that people like. They did the, the FDA requires certain studies and they did studies on this and they were like, oh, the human being can't even metabolize xanthan gum. We don't have the right bacteria in our gut to break this down. So it goes through unmetabolized. In just that short period of time, 30 to 40 years, our guts now do, they have developed, they, our guts have grown the bacteria that now will metabolize xanthan gum and we should be counting the calories that are in there. My understanding is the food manufacturers or the FDA hasn't changed that law. So the food manufacturers are not doing that, but that is the effect that these foods have in a very short period of time that in 20, 30 years, the additive of xanthan gum into our food processing and the abundant addition of it into our food sourcing has created our gut microbiome to be entirely different than it was for millennia before. So looking at this ingredient list and critiquing it, I have things highlighted in yellow. And these are just, again, things that we should be questioning. And we talked about this a little bit. Uh, stevia extract is not on that, but probably should be questioning that also. Um, the stuff in red pisses me off. I'm just going to tell you, it pisses me off. The fact that we are having organic erythritol, erythritol is poisonous to our body. Why it needs to be organic? Like it doesn't matter how organic it is. It's damaging our body. Like I don't care that it's extracted or that it's derived from an organic non-pesticide laden plant. It's a poison in and of itself. This is true, guys. Listen to me. This is true about organic alcohol. Like Budweiser has an organic brand, an organic line of beers. That's awesome that there's an organic line of beers. Alcohol is poisonous to the human body. It doesn't matter that it's pesticide-free. It alone is a chemical, a, a toxin. Like It doesn't matter that it's organic. So when they put organic, that is just a ploy that they are doing, that they are putting out there to hook humans and make them believe that this is good for them. We have to make you believe that it's good for you. That's something you need to question. It pisses me off that the FDA doesn't protect us from stupidity like that, but here we are. So, um, the red stuff makes me angry. And it's not that some things should be like organic. Like that's awesome that some things are really organic. Organic apples, that's great. Organic carrots, that's great. Carrots are not, like those are real foods and I do want them organic. But organic chemicals, no, they're chemicals that are damaging our body. There's some questions in the chat and the Q&A. So I want to make sure. Um, mentioned sweetness to the tongue, sends a message to the brain, send a message to pancreas. Does monk fruit with your, yes, yes, Sean, all of the sweeteners can have that same effect. I do believe it is unique to the human being about whether that's happening. How I help the clients in my group figure that, determine that is you cut, like you cut all the other stuff, all the egregious stuff, all the things that you're like, I know the Oreos are a problem. I'm going to cut them out of my life. If you cannot, after six weeks of doing that, you're still not seeing that fasting blood sugar drop into the range that you want it in. At that point, you do a, a, a two to three week trial without those sweeteners to see if it's leading to it. Erythritol definitely is damaging to the gut microbiome mixed. I don't, I don't feel like the evidence is as strong with monk fruit. Do understand when they extract stevia or monk fruit, which are again, two natural ones that probably have less of an effect of cravings in your brain, less of an effect of pancreatic stimulation of uh, insulin and less of an effect on your gut microbiome. Monk fruit and stevia tend to be healthier, better. However, pay attention, come back to me. Don't go ordering your stevia right now. There is certainly the fact that they use a lot of chemicals to extract it. Uh, there is a woman in the Facebook group. So if you're not in the Facebook group, go on there and get access to it, um, who actually made her own stevia. She did her own stevia sweetener. She bought the plant and she used water to extract it. And then she used that. So there is a way to get stevia or some of these um, sweeteners 
without using the chemical extraction methods that usually use chemical and industrial grade solvents that are not great for us. Um, so there's a way to do that, but erythritol, so the monk fruit with erythritol, I would not do that. That's definitely, um, it's yeah. And it's in everything. So you're totally right, Sean. It's in everything. Linda just asked, I never heard that erythritol is poisonous for us. Can we elaborate? Yeah. Erythritol is a poison. I mean, it depends on what you consider a poison. Okay. Erythritol is a, um, alcohol sugar. So is xylitol. So is sorbitol. All of these are alcohol sugars and they damage the gut microbiome. Hands down, they definitely damage the gut microbiome. So, um, I mean, any alcohol does, right? Like wine. Ladies, I love myself a good glass of wine. I love myself a good craft beer. I love alcohol. I mean, like I enjoy it. But basically, alcohol is the same thing that we're using on our hands to sterilize them from viruses and bacteria with hand sanitizer. And we're doing it to our gut. Now, is it a little less intense because we're having to go through the whole digestive system? Absolutely. Does some alcohol to get to your gut and damage your microbiome? Yes. Are there plenty of well-documented document, um, studies that look at whether alcohol damages your gut? Yes. And hands down, the answer is yes, it does. So erythritol, sorbitol, xylitol, all of those are sugar alcohols. It's doing the same thing. It's sterilizing your gut on some level. It's damaging those gut microbiome bacteria in some way. So again, like, is it poisonous? Well, I guess it depends on what you consider a poison. The alcohol, alcohol in general is a poison. Like your body, in fact, when you drink, when I drink a glass of wine, your body stops doing any other metabolism to detoxify that alcohol, which most women will see when they have a glass of alcohol, a glass of wine, uh, vodka tonic, whatever it might be, when they have that, their blood sugars drop. Most women notice this, your blood sugars drop. Why? Because your blood, your body stops metabolizing carbohydrates. It just stops because you just put a toxin in your body that it turns all of it, its attention to detoxifying. And when it detoxifies alcohol, it takes that one molecule of alcohol and it splits it into two other less toxic chemicals. And then it has to detoxify those. Okay. So, um, Sugar alcohols are going to do the same thing. They're definitely, and so again, I, as a poison, I guess that sounds really hyperbolic. I'm sorry, but I would look at them the same way I would alcohol. It's a toxin. Definitely. Let me know ladies, if that doesn't answer your question, I'm happy to um, elaborate more on that. So this ingredient list guys is a um, protein powder, which you probably put together. Um, this ingredient list, whole, um, whole grain oats, again, that's sugar, sugars, that's sugar, um, high monounsaturated canola oil. We already talked about these canola oils, these corn oils. It also has canola and, or a high monounsaturated sunflower oil. Okay. All of that is chemistry that's happening to a natural food, peanut butter. That's probably the most natural thing in this, um, oat bran, salt, those things are there but see that they are one of the last ingredients. So by weight, that is not one of the main parts that we are seeing in this food. Um, salt, rice flour, and soy lecithin. That lecithin is an emulsifier. It damages our gut microbiome, okay? That is, um, that's what's happening in this. This ingredient label is a nat natural, natu nature, woo, nature valley granola bar, okay? That's what this label is. So, um, I'm not even putting up Snickers bars. I did use Oreos because they were so great and exemplifying everything that's bad about processed foods. But I think a lot of times we want to think that these granola bars, these protein bars, all of these foods are healthy for us. They are not. They are not. They have a lot of things in them that are going to worsen your insulin resistance and your diabetes. Um, it is at the top of the hour or it's coming up on the top of the hour. If anybody has to hop off of this, you know, you can catch the end of it on YouTube. So don't hesitate to do that. Okay. Um, this is filtered water, which that is the main ingredient in this. So by weight, the most of what you're getting here is water, which is kind of awesome. Wheat gluten, we kind of talked about. Um, expeller pressed safflower oil. I can't visualize what that means. Non-sulfur dried apples. I don't know what that means. Maybe they didn't put sulfur to dry the apples. That's pretty awesome. That sounds like it might be okay. Has Yukon gold potatoes, natural flavored yeast extract. Mm. What does that mean? 
there's a number of different things and I'm like, what is that natural uh, hickory smoke flavor? Tarula yeast. I don't know what that is, but let's be honest. I don't know a lot about yeast, so that may not be a problem. So those are the things that I kind of question in this. Definitely the wheat gluten is going to be inflammatory and raise blood sugars. Okay. This ingredient list goes to vegetarian bratwurst. Again, this is something that is promoted and probably listed on its package as being healthy. Okay. There's a lot of questionable ingredients in here. Um, water, resin, uh, or a resistant wheat starch, which is actually meant to normalize. Anytime they're trying to make a starch resistant, they're trying to help the glycemic effect of it. So, okay, fine. Same with the resistant potato starch. And there's definitely benefits. There's like a lot of literature out there that these things are probably beneficial. Wheat protein, that's going to be um, gluten more than likely. Uh, cellulose, all extra virgin olive oil. I love that this uses extra virgin olive oil and not... Um, like a corn oil or canola oil, allulose, that's an os, that's a sweetener. And then it has all these other chemicals in it, right? You have the sodium and that's just sodium bicarbonate is um, baking soda. So it's nothing horrible or crazy. I don't know what monocalcium phosphate is. Um, some of these other things. So um, allulose is a sweetener. Like I said, the preservatives are going to damage your gut microbiome. Those are things, sorbic acid. That's something I would definitely stay away from. The xanthan gum, the guar gum, again, I would stay away from those things. You see the diglycerides. Those are the mono and diglycerides. Those are mono and diacylglycerols that we were just talking about. They contribute to triglyceride formation and they gum up the inside working of our bodies so that we can uh, normalize our so that our cells can burn off our um, glucose. The sodium metabiphosphate or met metabisulfate, I looked this up right before I came in here and it's some crazy chemical. Like it, oh, after looking it up, I'm like, oh yeah, that should definitely not be in food either. And it's like um, an industrial thing. It's used with like industrial chemicals, not with food. Like it's like, oh, I don't know that I want that in my food. This ingredient list is keto wraps. In case you were wondering, that's what that is. Um, so yes, so this is this is what I have for you on ingredients. Again, any questions, make sure they go in there. The three strategies that I teach primarily are cleaning up your diet, which I've represented here. This is where you're, I guess it's not the three strategies. I teach women a lot of different strategies in the group. These are the three I feel like you're going to get the most bang for your buck in improving your insulin function and your blood sugars and reversing your type 2 diabetes. These three strategies, cleaning up your diet, which is represented here, intermittent fasting, which is represented here, and exercise. These are the three most powerful tools I feel like a woman can use to normalize their insulin function. So um, I want to make sure if anybody has any questions, if you just found this useful, if this is just utterly shocking, Sean put, it's good to know about the erythritol. And it is. It's good to know about a lot of these things. These things are subtle. Food manufacturers want to make you like their food. It's what their business model is based on. The way that they do it is by making it taste a certain way so that you like it. And then somehow, whatever way... They can legally do it. They can't put cocaine in food, but they can certainly stimulate all of your heroin receptors with all of the sugar. Okay. So that is what they're doing. I don't know that it's right or wrong. I mean, I have opinions that I would not, it does not match my integrity to make people want to eat something that makes them sick. That is not how I would be able to live with myself. Um, I guess I'm not trying to say something's right or wrong. I'm just trying to say that this is what's happening and you need to be aware of it in your food so you can improve your um, insulin resistance and your diabetes. Ladies, this is what I help women do. This is what the group program helps women do. There is access, you know, every week, multiple times a week, you have access to getting these questions answered, to me evaluating your food logs so that you can see. And I will tell you, I do it all the time. There's a couple of women in here that have been in the group and I do it. Like they send me a log and I'm like, I just need you to know that this is in there. You need to be aware that this is in that food. And you, then you get to make the decision. Y'all are grown ass women. You can make whatever decision you want about your food. I'm just going to let you know the science behind it. And sometimes that's all it takes. Like we pull out the really egregious stuff and we normalize our insulin resistance and our A1C. 
sometimes we pull out the really egregious stuff and we don't see those effects, the entire effect that we want to see. Sometimes we have to do more with fasting. Sometimes we have to do more with building our muscle because our muscle, muscle tissue is insulin sensitive. It is more insulin sensitive than our other tissue. The more we build of that, the more we can pull our blood sugars down. When we pull our blood sugars down through the insulin sensitivity in our muscle, we stop sending a message to our pancreas to say, hey, put out more insulin. All of that improves. So that's why these are the strategies that I feel like have the most power to fixing your type 2 diabetes. And that's what I help women do. So I appreciate you showing up today and this morning, and I hope you found it helpful. As you go through your life, if you find questions and you're like, oh, I wonder if this food, I wonder what that is. Don't hesitate to send me a message. You can send me a message, Delane at DelaneMD.com. I'm happy to answer anything. If you've sent me a message and I haven't answered, it's because it got buried in email. Send it again. I will not find it in any way harassing. I want you to have the help that you need to reverse your type 2 diabetes. That's what's really important to me. I want everybody to hear you do not have to sit and be sick for the rest of your life tied to the healthcare industry just getting sicker and sicker and sicker, buying more meds, more meds, more meds, buying more healthcare, healthcare, healthcare. You don't need to do that. There is a way to live naturally healthy. And that's what I want everybody to have an opportunity to get to. So send me any messages that you have or any questions. Sean, you are so welcome. I hope everybody has a great weekend. I will talk to you next time.